Um, so my name is Scott Brewer, I'm from Art Processes. Chances are you probably don't know who Art Processes are unless you know me or one of the other guys who works for Art Processes. Uh, we do apps for sites. We, up until about a month ago, we didn't release things into the App Store. We worked with enterprise releases. We did things that were designed so that you would actually turn up to a venue, you would get an app, and it would change the way that you actually moved and created and did things in that space. It, that, that's what we were designed to do. Uh, we worked with Mona, which is where we all came from. Art Processes started in uh, October 2011. Mona opened in January 2011. Art Processes actually came off the back of the Mona uh, experience being well received. Uh, it was started in about 2006. Um, we got together and, well, Tony and Nick, who are the other two co-founders, started working about 2006 for this project. For those of you who don't know what uh, Mona is, it's the Museum of Old and Art, New Art. It's in Hobart, Tasmania. It opened in January 2011. Uh, it's about 7,500 7 square meters of space. Um, there, at the moment, there's only about 400 artworks in there because they're shipping in a new uh, exhibition that's due to open in July. Generally, there's around six to 800 artworks in there. It is Australia's largest private gallery. It's all funded by one man, David Walsh. If you're in Australia, you've probably seen his name mentioned in the newspapers. Um, he likes to get around. He's quite eccentric, and he's a really nice person. And he is the reason that I have a job. Um, what happens at Mona is um, everyone who goes in there gets an iPod touch on, on entrance. Um, and you use that to actually get the information about the artworks as you, as you move throughout Mona. Uh, Mona was originally the Marula Museum of Antiquities, and it's, uh, it started in a little house that's right up the top of there before they built the three stories underground um, to get the rest of it in there. It, in 2006 or so, it closed down. It looked like this originally. Um, this was David's original collection of antiquities. There's lots of coins, lots of ancient artifacts. David is really passionate about all the works that he owns, and he used to write these wall labels. Um, and on these wall labels would these be these descriptions about why the artwork was so important to him. Like, why did I spend $10 million on this coin? Because to you and me, it's just a coin, right? Like, I couldn't care if he spent $10 million on it or tw 20 cents on it, unless it was a 50 cent coin, then I'd probably care. Um, but he had all these great reasons for, for why these were important pieces. And when he was building this museum, he was really sort of upset with it, because he's sort of like, oh, you know, it's a museum, but it looks like every single other museum in the world. And that's kind of disappointing. David likes to do things differently. And he, what he really wanted to do was build a museum that looked like this. This is what Mona looks like at the moment. Um, well, this is from about 12 months ago, but it looks very similar. It's very dark. There is no information on the walls. There is nothing about anything in there. There is just artwork, and there's artwork, and it's lit beautifully, and it's a really amazing experience if you haven't been down there. You walk into this place, and it's really unlike any art gallery you've probably ever been to in your life. Um, you walk into a space that is very similar to this. It's black. It is surrounded with beautiful pieces, and they look absolutely amazing. You can understand why uh, you know, these things are getting sold for lots and lots of money. So David, in 2006, was um, building this new gallery, and, and he knew that he wanted to get to this stage, but he wasn't sure how he was actually going to do it. Now, the other two guys I was started the company with, um, Tony and Nick, were working for David at the time. They were doing website for him. They were doing part of the Mono website. They were also building a catalog to start um, uh, collecting the information about all the artworks that David owned. Um, and they were having conversation with David, and he, he sort of said that, look, I've got these two ideas that I really want people in my new museum when it gets built. I want people to really be able to uh, interrogate the works. I really want them to be able to understand, but I want to be able to do that without detracting from the works. The other thing that I really want people to be able to do is I want them to be able to give me feedback on whether they love or hate the artwork. Um, there were a couple of reasons why David wanted to do this. One in particular was that he said he wanted to remove the works that people loved and put the works that people hated up at the front because he really wanted to offend them. He has, um, he has done that uh, to, to keep his word. He did move um, 150 porcelain vaginas that was one of the most popular works out of the gallery because people liked it too much. Um, they got a lot of crap for that and I think one of them came back and is in the gallery again now. 
Um, so what happened was th this, he came to Tony and Nick with this problem, and so they said, look, guys, w what do you reckon we can do to solve this? And so this is, you know, 2007, 2008. They're sitting there thinking, oh, you know, like, what, what do we got to do? We've got to be able to get people this information. They were looking at the technology that existed at the time. I think they started building some stuff in Flash. Um, they were maybe looking at some iPacks. Um, and then they realized that what they really needed to do was they really needed to be able to get someone's location within the space. Now, as you're all aware now, you can get your phone, you can walk outside, it knows exactly where you are on the street, but when you walk inside here, it has absolutely no idea where you are. Um, to get people this information about these artworks really, really, really easily, we had to know where they were standing and present them with the list of the artworks that were nearby so that they could pick the one that they wanted. It's not always the one that you're right next to that you want to look at because there might be, you know, uh, there's a giant Sydney Nolan piece that hangs up there, but there's something at your feet here. You're probably going to be drawn to that piece, but it's a little bit further away. Um, so a lot of effort went into trying to work out how could we actually do this. In 2008, when the um, iPhone SDK was released, I guess it realized that iPod touches were the best. They were really the piece of technology that was going to kind of put, the, put it all into place. So we ended up building pretty much everything from scratch. Um, there's backends that actually support placement of all the artworks. So there's, you know, the collection database has the information about all the artworks, standard things, um, you know, who it was made by, um, what year it was made, all the pieces of information that are written by David, by Elizabeth, by Jane, by a lot of the other people who submit the audio recordings, all that sort of stuff. And that all goes into this, uh, this piece of software that you can then place these artworks within the space. Um, when you download your, or well, you don't download it, when you actually get given your iPod Touch, it's, it's a pretty s simple application, really. I mean, it's a, it's a list view that goes into a tab view. Um, there's a couple of little features in there. You can, you know, love and hate the artworks and stuff like that. But really, it's just, it's, everything is kept as simple as it possibly can be. We had people coming through that we didn't know that they'd ever used an iPod before. Um, you know, it's a museum. A lot of the people who were coming by were going to be anywhere from, you know, up to 80, 90 years old and bringing their kids along. And, and they need to be able to get this information as well. Um, so we really had to keep things as simple as possible and put a lot of effort into the way that you actually think about, um, you know, user experience and, and user interaction, stuff like that. Um, so we ended up with this very simple application that uh, you can just scroll through, select the work that you want to um, interrogate, read all the information that David's written or anyone else has written, love or hate the work. Um, and when we released this in January 2011, um, we, we weren't really prepared for what was actually going to happen. We didn't know whether people were going to like this. A lot of people who love the museums were like, oh, everyone's going to hate it. They're not going to want to walk through the space with this thing around their neck. People just want to know what the name of the artist is or this is way too much work. But what we realized is that people were really, really enjoying this and it was really changing the way that they were actually um, engaging with the museum. Uh, because of their ability to be able to love and hate artworks, they could actually get feedback as to how many other people loved or hated that artwork. Um, they could look at the artworks and just they could really feel that, that kind of connection as an individual to the space that they hadn't been able to receive previously in a gallery where there's, there's nothing, there's nothing personal about going into a gallery and looking at the same wall labels everyone else looks at. Like, you know, maybe there's a feedback form at the end or you can email them after your tour. But with this, you're actually able to go through, look at only the ones you wanted to look at, and you could give your feedback about loving and hating them. Um, as of now, this slide's probably 12 months old. We've had about 30 million uh, artworks interrogated on the device. Um, and so this all worked really, really well for us. And one of the things we also didn't realize when we started out was we weren't really sure what we were going to do with all that data. Um, you know, obviously, David wanted to know how many people were loving and hating these things. We wanted to give people feedback about that sort of stuff. And we wanted people to be able to come back and, and look at this stuff because um, it's not an app you can download because it, it requires an RFID tag to get your location. Um, there were originally a whole bunch of private APIs that were going in there that we were using. Um, it, it just wasn't feasible that you could download this and take it with you. So we wanted to make sure that they got um, an experience uh, when they left the museum as well. So we were able to take their location data as to where they went. We were able to look at the artworks that they looked at and give them this, this path 
that they traveled through the museum. They can look at all the artworks that they really enjoyed, and they can look at all the artworks that they didn't enjoy, and they can look at all the ones that they missed, which is really important, because if they missed an artwork and they really want to see it, chances are they're probably going to come back and have a look at that. Um, one thing that a lot of people will say that the, uh, the, the app is called, you don't really get an app down at Mona, you, you get a device called the O, and the whole thing is the O. And so a lot of people will say, oh, you know, you, you write iPhone apps, and it's like, well, yeah, we do. Um, this is the worst slide of this deck. I designed this one. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> it's actually a lot more than writing an app. And I mean, you, got, you guys know, like, when you write apps, it's not always about the software that you, you write. It's about everything else that you're actually interacting and engaging with. And to make sure that people were... The difference between someone enjoying this experience and, and walking down there and saying, this thing's a piece of crap and, and it's ruined my whole time is... It's really small. Um, to give you an example, a project like this went live at the Getty Museum, I think, in around 2005, and it was pulled after five days, and I think they'd invested a couple of million dollars into it and seven years prior to that. And the reason it went, was pulled was because the user experience was so terrible that people were leaving the museum earlier than they were leaving when it wasn't there at all. And that, that's, not, that's not a good look. So we had to do lots and lots and lots of testing um, that you probably don't get the opportunity to because you probably don't have tables of 200 iPods um, hanging around. But we were doing um, network testing um, to make sure that data was actually getting to these. We were making sure that um, there were enough access points actually in, in the museum to handle all of these sorts of things. Um, you know, people are walking through requesting audio um, getting images on the fly. We were obviously caching as much as we could, but there's still a lot of stuff that actually goes on live in there. You can uh, stream audio from any of the artworks to your device over low latency audio, so uh, sub 200 millisecond from any audio input source. You can plug it in. And we got to learn a lot of stuff about how our iPods switch wirelessly. And I mean, you'll see here, this is going from one access point to a second access point, and you lose all your audio and everything jitters, and it's a really terrible experience. Um, so which is why we had to write private APIs originally so we could actually get people to hook up to the most powerful access point, because quite often the iPod will sit there and hang on to the one that is you know, three away from you, because well, it doesn't really need that much data at the moment. Um, Lots of lots of fun stuff that we did there. That's the streaming audio. We also had to build um, charging units because uh, no one builds charging units for 1,340 iPods, unsurprisingly. Uh, we built these guys. They hold 240 iPods. Um, we had to build trays for um, handout booths because um, on I think on opening day, there were three and a half thousand people coming through, uh, and you know you've got to get these things out to them and. Anything that holds someone up is is an excuse for them to just hate you. And um, we had to build, we had to really minimise that. David was quite adamant that um, you know if it was our fault, well we were adamant that if it was our fault, we didn't want to be blamed. Uh, we had to build hard cases for them because they have RFID tags in the back of them. Um, no one else makes these things, so it was quite a quite a fascinating experience, really. And at the end of it all, um, before we were all you know independent contractors working on this job. And we had no idea what was going to happen. And when it launched, people really, really liked it. Um, we did some surveys a couple of months in, and we were told that 80% of the people who were surveyed said that this actually enhanced their experience at the museum. We're like, oh, that's, that's really amazing. You know, um, People were really giving us good feedback on it. So we decided that we could try and form art processes. Uh, we kind of do two things uh, at art processes. We do individual custom experiences for site-specific installations. And after the success of Mona, we actually have a product that is um, being launched about a month ago that's going to get launched properly. Like it's, it's in use, I guess, now, but um, it's not open to the public yet. Uh, that's going to get launched probably towards the end of this year so that you can actually do the Mona experience at any gallery for a much cheaper price than David paid. Um, and we've, as a result of that, we've done our own indoor positioning and we've got be Bluetooth beacons that get your location and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but while we were doing that, we still wanted to do the custom, um, you know, we don't want to sit back and just say, well, we did this thing at Mona, we've got to keep progressing. So we were really fortunate to be able to get offered um, uh, work with Melbourne Zoo. Now, there's 
Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but there's a tour that goes on at 7 p.m. at Melbourne Zoo after the zoo's closed down. It's called I Animal. It opened in November. Um, it was done in conjunction with an Adelaide-based theatre company who came up with a lot of the um, ideas, or they came up with all the ideas. We were just the technology partner. Um, and 200 people, up to 200 people, can turn up to the zoo at, at 7 p.m. They get given an iPod. Uh, when they start, everything starts at 7 o'clock, they get asked a few questions, they interact with the device, and then they go off onto various paths and they're guided by the device. And the device gets them to do... There were two things. One, the zoo really wanted to try and reach out to audience members between the age of 18 and 40 who didn't have children because, and no one between the age of 18 and 40 who doesn't have kids. Apparently, they don't go to the zoo. Um, they were really looking for a, a reason to get people out to the zoo. They were looking at a way that they could improve the way that people actually enjoy the space. Um, from a theatre company perspective, they had done something similar in Adelaide uh, for four nights during... Adelaide Festival or maybe Adelaide Fringe Festival. Uh, and they were looking at ways of actually building something that was going to be able to up last a lot longer than four nights. So it was a, you, know, you could adjust the times, you could take loops out if monkeys were sick or something like that. Um, and the key elements were that you wanted, people wanted to be able to get a takeaway with, from that and that they wanted to be able to have um, a theatre experience that's known as Auto Theatro. Now, in auto theatro, what will happen is you get a set of headphones each and you're in sync with audio and one person will be given instructions and the other person will get given the audio that actually goes along with the story. So unwillingly, you actually become the actor in somebody else's play. Um, it's quite um, an engaging experience. Uh, if you haven't gone out there, it, it is running during winter in limited times, it's like Friday and Saturday night at 7pm for two of the four loops. Everyone starts at the beginning, at the front of the zoo, as I said. Um, we had to make sure that everything again, like Mona, was, was handled with Wi-Fi. These devices need to be updated and because you have to get told which loop you're going on and the loops all have to be evenly spread, everyone has to talk to a server. Um, it's not all that easy to get 200 devices to um, all be on a wireless connection. Um, once you get into the zoo, you all split up. The people that you've come with, you don't know where they're necessarily going to go. Um, you don't know what audio you're going to receive. And you all finish at exactly the same time around this carousel. And so you have this individual experience. You walk through the zoo, you see a bunch of animals, um, you get told stories about them that you're not going to know otherwise. Um, and it is a group experience, but also very much uh, an individual experience. It really asks you to, to question uh, elements of yourself. The, each of the four loops is based on a human emotion. So there's uh, phobias, uh, life cycles, beliefs, and ancestry. Uh, and they're tied up to certain animals. Um, this is an example of one of the auto theatros that goes on. So the, one group is getting instructions in their audio to actually t undertake these actions and uh, the other group is sitting there watching on getting told a story that the first group's already been made aware of. In this case, it's about um, the baboons and their, uh, their new house and how they were scared of the sky because they'd never actually seen the sky before because before this one, they had lived in cages. Um, as I said, you get to see lots of animals and there are um, actors involved as well, so it's, it's, it is live theatre. Um, Interestingly, what we had done with both of those experiences is look at two very different ways that you can use new technologies to help people navigate through space. Um, in one, at the zoo, it was a purely temporal experience. It, does ha it has no idea about where you are. If you turn right and you get lost, you're screwed. Um, if you go down to Mona, the, the whole idea about Mona is that it is a self-guided tour. Um, there, there is a map of tour of of Mona inside the application, but that was only put in, uh, th I think, three to six months after it actually launched. David originally didn't want any maps. He wanted people to go down there, get completely lost, and just discover artworks. Um, and so, yeah, that's, they're, they're two different ways that you can use technology to actually really change the way that people move through the space. Uh, this is a good shot of our, uh, of our tester getting everything in sync. Um, if you've worked with time before on iPods, it's not the easiest thing. They change their time according to sitting to syncing to Apple servers. 
and when you want to get things <laughs> within like a second, it's um, it's 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 not that great a task. So. I'm going to wrap up with uh, sort of three takeaways, I guess, for, for ways that you can actually use these technologies to change the way that people actually move through space or improve the way, like things that you have to do if you want to get this kind of project right. The first is um, th really think about the user space. I mean, th people have been using space now the same way for a very long time. Um, the mobile computing is, you know, like it's still in its infancy. and museums in particular, for the last 100 or 150 years, they've all, they all look the same. David was right. I mean, you know, you go into a museum, it's a bunch of pictures on a wall, and there's plaques that tell you what, who, who made those works. Now, there's technology that exists now to be able to remove that from the wall and actually change the way that you can interact in that space. It, it puts the power in your hands versus, you know, the power being in the hands of the curator. You can investigate and interrogate as much of that um, content as you want. Um, second is, uh, sorry for the crude um, slides, I was trying to work out what um, tagline to go with. Uh, every, and this one is, um, the, was going to be don't cut corners or something, but then I couldn't find a good one that image, so it's, you've got a puzzle. But it's the fact that <laughs> um, you, you've really got to think about every single piece of, of, of the, the journey or the, um, the installation. Uh, if you've got poor Wi-Fi reception or if you've got, um, you know, like bugs in your app, like people are going to really hate that experience. And as soon as they hate the experience, they're going to hate you. They're going to hate the place that they're in. They're not going to have an enjoyable time. It's kind of depressing, but like as a technology, um, the technology provider on these experiences, our job is to be like not remembered. Um, our, our job is just to provide people with the content that they want to get to in the, in the most seamless way that we possibly can to make their enjoyment of the space as great as it can be. It's not to sit there and go, oh, wow, this is the most amazing app I've ever seen in my life. That's, that's not what we set out to do. Um, the third one is that w just make sure you squash every single bug you can before it goes out there because um, it's, in terms of writing my own code, the, probably there, there have been two things that have really um, aided in improving my code. And one is working with a fantastic developer, and the other is working with the world's greatest bug tester. And um, uh, we work with a guy who will just, he will find things that you possibly would never have thought even existed. Um, and sure enough, they turn up to be bigger deals than, than you thought, you know. And um, as a developer, I never have the patience to actually do that myself. Um, I'll look through an app and be like, get me to the end, I'm, I'm good to go, I'll hand that out to everyone. And um, it's sadly not the case. Um, that's all I've got for you. Thanks very much for your time. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Cheers.